Chinese Vice Premier Liu He held a phone talk with U.S. Trade Rep Catherine Tai on Thursday. Both sides believe the development of bilateral trade is very important and have also exchanged views on issues of mutual concern and agreed to maintain communication. In fact, the relations between China and the U.S. took a turn for the worse when former President Donald Trump was in office. Foreign policy analysts expected the earlier an easing of tensions under President Joe Biden, but that hardly happened so far. The success of Biden administration's China policy depends on how the United States changes, said Joseph Nye, a well-known U.S. scholar. In an article published recently on Project Syndicate website, Nye called China-U.S. relationship a cooperative rivalry in which, he said, the terms of competition will require equal attention to both sides of the oxymoron. Can the Biden administration ultimately breathe new life into China-U.S. relations? What's going to be, really, the nature of relations? I spoke to Professor Joseph Nye, the former dean of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Let's hear his insights. Professor Nai, what a pleasure to see you once again back at home. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. There are crucial issues between the two countries, uh, China and the United States. We see these days there were even temptations to put out so-called uh, Strategic Competition Act, uh, trying to further diminish the hope of creating further exchanges between China and the United States, the two largest powers, some argue, in the world. How do you see this trend in America? I object to the idea that this is a new Cold War. Uh, I have argued that in many things I've written here, yes, mm -hmm. there is going to be strategic competition. And we should both realize that. Mm -hmm. But the crucial thing is what uh, uh, has been called managed strategic competition, mm -hmm. or what I call a cooperative rivalry, which will there be areas where the U.S. and China can cooperate at the same time that there are areas where we will compete simultaneously. And we have to develop the maturity to realize that uh, you can do two things at the same time, even though they uh, seem to be contradictory. A good example is the, the U.S. and China disagree, for example, on uh, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Mm. Uh, that's an area of strategic competition. At the same time, the U.S. and China agree on the importance of reducing the carbon intensity of our economies mm because that's in our self-interest as well as in the world interest. You have President Biden and President Xi Jinping uh, joining hands virtually on the need to do something about uh, global climate change. Mm. That's what I call a mature relationship. Mm. And all this talk about a new Cold War uh, gets in the way of mature relationship. I, I do want to ask you about that because that there seems to be a myth that explaining uh, you could have a mature relationship in which you have some areas that you are just not going to cooperate, you are going to be rivalry, and it's not going to spill over to the other area in which you are uh, wonderful cooperative partners. Uh, I just find that very different to understand from the Chinese philosophy. You know the yin and the yang uh, in yes. ancient Chinese philosophy. Even though there are two apparently opposition forces, eventually they turned into each other in a way and uh, converge, divert, always going with that process all at the same time. That to me was fascinating. Maybe there was something about that built in my mind, even though I'm not a philosopher in China. Uh, but to that point, it's very hard to understand that how you could have aspects of relationship in this very important relationship. Some of those are just blossoming while others are going to the dire street. I, it, it, to me, it's very hard to understand, and I would assume very hard to manage at all. Professor. I, I agree, and it's very hard for many Americans to understand as well. Uh, and that's why it's important to have political leaders who are able to maintain a sense of balance. Uh, the ability to 
uh, manage two contradictory things at the same time uh, is one of the crucial skills of a successful leader. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, my impression is that the leaders we have today uh, can understand that. But the danger is if there's too much rising nationalism, whether it's in China or in the U.S., and the leaders are pressed to take more extreme stands, they may get into situations which have unintended consequences. It's unavoidable, uh, it seems, that, Professor, because when the atmosphere is toxic and soured, anything can happen when it comes to national sentiments toward each other or toward others. I agree, and that's why I think uh, the fact that uh, we have a great deal of economic um, interdependence as well as social contacts that are but somewhere like 3 million Chinese who come to the U.S. every year as tourists or students and so forth. I think these are very important balancing factors in the relationship as a whole. So I, I, I think the great danger in my mind is mm. that if political leaders appeal to nationalism to gain support at home, uh, they may be drawn out beyond where they can manage the process. Mm. When people talk about a Cold War, they draw the image of 1945. Um, Henry Kissinger has said, and I mm -hmm. agree with him on this, the right historical analogy is 1914, when none of the leaders really wanted World War I, but by carelessness and extreme nationalism, mm -hmm. they got into a situation which was devastating for everybody. So that's why it's crucial to manage this relationship uh, very carefully. One of the things we hate to say, but have to now, whether this administration with apparent good intention at the very beginning of the office will follow into the trap of the earlier administration in which in the, they see the relationship. There are going to be areas where uh, we will see some decoupling between our two economies. The important thing is that we say, okay, these are for particular areas where we each have security concerns, but let's not let it spill over into trying to decouple the economies as a whole. That would be a serious mistake economically and politically. So I think the we have to prepare the public for realization that there'll be some areas where there indeed will be some degree of drawing apart between the two economies and societies, but we should not let it spill over into a general argument that everything Chinese is bad, everything American is bad. My own personal view is that uh, yes, there will be a competition but in the long run, China doesn't pose an existential threat to the United States. And the United States doesn't pose an existential threat to China. We have no interest in taking over China. China has no interest in taking over the United States. So yes, there will be competition, but it's not a lethal competition. Mm. You have to keep that in mind by keeping the relations between the economies and societies even where there are times when we'll be intensely competing. Mm. To a political scientist and slash historian, <laughs> Professor Nye, uh, how do you see the current period of time that we are going through right now? This is the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning, we're in the transition. Where are we now, if I could borrow some of your wisdom? Are you also trying to exchange your wisdom with your Chinese counterpart, for example, other political scientists and historians? Well, we, we uh, I have been involved in a number of what are sometimes called uh, track two dialogues sure. with uh, Chinese counterparts. Uh, and uh, some of them held at Beida University, some in Shanghai, and so forth. And I think it's important to keep those kinds of dialogues open uh, so that both sides have a better understanding of the other. So uh, I maintain Chinese friends. Uh, I think they consider me still uh, uh, somebody they can talk to openly. Um, and I think that's an important uh, uh, avenue 
to try to moderate the types of uh, uh, dangers that mm. we've been displaying. Let's jump out of the China-U.S. thing a bit, because the world is not just China and the United States. How do you assess, Professor Nye, with the current situation of the U.S., the allied relationship the U.S. has with its partners uh, through the past few decades, for example, with Europe, which certainly uh, having different views about the United States, to say the least? Well, the U.S.-European relationship has always reminded me of, uh, of a family in which you can often have uh, uh, severe fights among the, uh, uh, the siblings, but also among the adults over particular issues, but they don't lead to a divorce. Um, mm. European... Uh, uh, but is that fight uh, won by the U.S. Uh, through hard power or soft power now? No, I think it's a. I think it's a combination. On hard power, it remains a fact that European countries feel threatened by Russia. After all, Putin is massing a hundred thousand troops on the borders of Ukraine mm. and took Crimea from Ukraine by force. And in that sense, having an alliance in NATO with the United States uh, is important for deterrence of Russia in the European minds. So that's a hard power dimension. On the other hand, uh, there's also a soft power dimension in the sense that uh, Europeans uh, have similar values to the United States on issues like democracy and human rights. And that creates an attraction that's mutual in both directions uh, to the extent to which the, each other's societies practice uh, those of uh, democracy and human rights. Mm. So I think the European-U.S. relationship is uh, based on both hard and soft power. Mm. When was the time, Professor Nye, that you witnessed a transition as what you are seeing right now, if it is a transition? Well, I, I think the, uh, uh, probably the uh, end of the Cold War in, uh, 90s uh, was a major transition. I think the Americans um, uh, became overly ambitious with the invasion of Iraq and now have been uh, drawing back from that overambition. So that was a, a major uh, transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and that disrupted a good deal of, of, of international politics. I also think that during this same period, uh, the uh, rise of China, Chinese economic growth, mm. which was a very good thing in raising hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, uh, but it also created a sense of fear that as China invested more of its economic wealth in military power, uh, that it was threatening to uh, uh, American friends and allies and so forth. So those two things that uh, coincided, I think, led to a, a significant changes in international politics in the, uh, let's say, the 20, the, the 20, uh, 2001, let's say, to 2010 or so. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, a, a transition in world politics then. Mm. Final question for you, Professor Nye. How do you see the fact, as I at least see it, that these days perceptions and narratives apparently are much bigger and much more persistent than the facts and the realities on many issues? Well, you're correct that uh, narrative matters. And sometimes people say, well, then we're all living in a world of, of propaganda. But propaganda doesn't work if it's not credible. And uh, for example, people think, well, good propaganda produces attraction, which is soft power. But if propaganda is not credible, if it's not trusted, uh, then it doesn't attract. It will be tested so the, by time only. It'll, it's exactly, it's tested by reality. To, if, if the is too far from reality, 
eventually the gap between the narrative and reality becomes apparent for not credible and therefore doesn't produce soft power. Mm. Very interesting, uh, Professor Nye. I think this is certainly an unprecedented uh, period of time for me uh, in my lifetime to see all the changes and how people are reacting to the changes. And I guess maybe for you to certain degrees as well. <laughs> well, nobody knows the future and it's always <laughs> difficult to interpret the present. But I thought the questions that you've asked me are exactly the right types of questions, good, smart questions that we both in both our countries have to address. Mm. I should conclude by saying that in the end, I remain uh, optimistic. I would love to be in your camp, the optimism camp. Thank you so much, Professor Joseph Nye. As always, what a pleasure. Thank you, sir. And a pleasure for me. My interview with Joseph Nye. Professor Nye shared once again his thoughts with us about the nature of U.S.-China relations. If you'd like to see more Search World Inside, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Thanks.